it seems like, at, at least to me, it seems that the older I get, the less inclined I am to get overly excited about my birthday. Uh, my birthday was a few months ago, so don't worry. You all missed it. It's fine. Um, but I'm just, I, I'm, I've, I'm not really a, the sort of person who gets overly enthusiastic about my birthday. I don't feel the need to have a big celebration or anything like that. Um, I don't make a big fuss over it. It's just not as exciting as it used to be for me. Uh, maybe you've found the same in your own life, but, uh, but somewhere along the lines, things just kind of change for us. As a kid, we, we get really excited about our birthday because we know our, our mom and dad are going to make a big fuss over it. Uh, maybe you're going to have a little party. At the very least, you're probably going to get a cake, uh, maybe some gifts of some kind too, and you get really psyched up about that. But, but as the years go on, it just sort of is there, right? Like it, it, for me, it's just kind of become another day. Uh, you know, this year I didn't do a whole lot for my birthday. I didn't work, because who wants to work on their birthday? But I just didn't go anywhere or do anything. Not that my family didn't want to make a fuss over me. It's just that I chose to not make a big deal about it, because it's just kind of the routine. Um, kind of off on a little bit of a downer note, aren't we? Yeah, we're all getting old. Hooray. But it's just, it, it, I'm not trying to be a downer, it's just the older I get, again, the less inclined I am to celebrate my birthday. It, again, it wasn't always that case. I remember when I was about four, maybe five, maybe six, but I think that'd be pushing it. Uh, Mom and dad had a, a birthday party for me, and I think they had it at a Hardee's that maybe used to be on Markland, is that right? Am I remembering that correctly? It was a Pizza Hut, excuse me. Had a big ball pit, had a big, you know, play area and all that stuff for kids, it was awesome because like a lot of my friends were there, a lot of family members, cousins, all of them came and we had cake, we had presents, we did all the fun stuff that you're supposed to do. And mom and dad even splurged a little bit that year and hired somebody to come to my birthday party dressed up as a Ninja Turtle. Ironically, at 38, if somebody would have come to my birthday party dressed up as a Ninja Turtle, I'd be just as excited as I was at four or five years old. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Mandy. Uh, Mandy's taking notes for next year. Uh, it was so exciting and so overwhelming that I actually got a nosebleed from all the joy I was experiencing. Either that or somebody hit me in the face with a ball. Let's call it both. It was fine. Uh, but, you know, it was, it was a great birthday for me. Uh, fast forward a couple of years later, a couple being more than a decade, when I turned 18, mom and dad actually threw me a surprise birthday party. And it, it caught me completely off guard because it wasn't something I was expecting or or, you know, I didn't ask for it or anything like that. It just sort of happened. But, like, they were able to convince me and surprise me with this because my dad had told me we had to go over to the church to set up chairs and tables. And that's something that, you know, happened all the time for us. My dad was a deacon at our church at the time, and, and it, for some reason, was his responsibility. If there was going to be an event at the church, he had to bring Blake and Brandon with him to go and set up tables and chairs. And so I thought that we were just doing that again. I was like, oh, it's my birthday. I don't really want to, but all right, fine, whatever. And then we get there, and suddenly all my friends are there, including some friends that my parents didn't know. So I'm not really sure how they all got there, but uh, yeah, it was great. It was a surprise birthday party for me. But, but again, the older I get, just I, it's not as exciting to me anymore. I don't really know why. I can't really explain that to you, but... Like, for instance, the best birthday I've ever had as an adult, as somebody over the age of, let's say, 20, the best birthday I've ever had was the birthday where Mandy and I first had gotten married. She had been at work that morning. Uh, I had stayed home and slept in because it was my birthday and I could. And I woke up to the smell of my wife making me biscuits and gravy. <laughs> I know, right? And you never had Mandy's biscuits and gravy. Whew. If I get to heaven and it's not those biscuits and gravy, I'm going to tell Mandy to go give God her recipe. Uh, <laughs> but I woke up to that smell, and I walk into the kitchen where Mandy's at, and she hands me this heaping plate of biscuits and gravy, a big old fat stack of comic books, and says the most magical words ever, I have to go back to work. I love you. Happy birthday. <laughs> she left me alone with my biscuits, my gravy, and Batman comics. It was a great day. <laughs> But that's, that's where I get excited about my birthday now, is just to kind of have that. It's not as exciting to, to have a big fuss made over myself or anything like that. And, and maybe, maybe you feel the same way, but maybe you're somebody who's different. Maybe you're somebody who tries to make some, a big deal out of their birthday every year. That's not a bad thing by any stretch of the imagination, but it, 
it can be somewhat off-putting, don't you think? It makes all the sense in the world to have a big blowout party celebration for those milestones birthdays, right? Like 40. 40 is a great age to have a big blowout birthday party. But it's a little weird to show up at a big birthday blowout for somebody who's turning 43, right? Like that's an odd age to have a gigantic birthday party for. If, if you wanted to spend that particular birthday going out to eat with your friends or family, that makes a lot of sense. But if you're, if you're one of those people who's attending a big birthday bash for somebody who's turning 43, at a certain point, there's going to be a part of you that's just sitting there wondering, why are we celebrating this? Why is this the party that we're having for this particular age? And there's just this part of us as, as human beings where it becomes increasingly difficult for us to gain the same level of excitement or enthusiasm or even joy when something becomes part of our annual routine. Right? Maybe you've noticed over the last few years, maybe a couple decades, whatever, that and it gets harder and harder for you to get excited about certain holidays. Right? When you were a kid, you couldn't wait for it. As soon as the calendar turned to that month, you were all amped up. You had you know, a countdown going for that particular holiday or, or that particular anniversary in your life or that particular birthday even. You were excited. You couldn't wait. You had trouble sleeping because you, you just wanted to get to it. Now as an adult, though... You find yourself looking at the calendar going, oh, I guess it's that time of the year again, isn't it? You find yourself a little less inclined to be excited about this sort of thing that at one point in time was the biggest and, and the greatest thing that was going on in your world. But now when it's become part of just what you do on a normal basis, eh, yay. What happens every year is happening again. Hooray. It gets harder, right? Am I, am I the only one? Like, am I the only one who's struggling with this? As if that's the case, then I'm a weirdo and I need to go see somebody about that. But I think it's a normal everyday thing that whenever we have these things that we used to get excited about, at some point in time we find ourselves wondering, why are we celebrating this? Why is this such a big deal? We reach that place where it becomes harder and harder for us to find that joy of celebration. And instead, we're asking, why are we celebrating? Jesus actually talked about celebration. In fact, he told three different parables, one right after another, that all revolve around the notion of celebration. But the celebrations that Jesus brings about in these particular parables are a little strange things to be celebrating. At least in my opinion, maybe you'll find it too. We're going to be in Luke chapter 15 today, so if you've got a Bible near you, open it up to Luke 15, because again, we're going to see some back-to-back -back parables that involve this notion of celebration, and what's being celebrated feels like such a strange thing to celebrate. Again, I could be the only one who thinks they're unusual, maybe you will see the, the joy that comes with it, but for me, it's a little hard. But the first one uh, takes place in, in Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. It says there, all the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him, him being Jesus. And the Pharisees and scribes were complaining, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man among you who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them does not leave the ninety-nine in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it? When he has found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders, and coming home, he calls to his friends and neighbors together, saying to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I want to, again, take a step back and, and present this whole scenario that Jesus is showing us here. A fella has got 100 sheep, and, and even by today's standards, that's a lot of sheep. And I don't know how much you know about sheep or what kind of interactions you've ever had with sheep in your life. That's a weird statement, right? What kind of interactions you've had with sheep? That implies a conversation. We don't need to go there. But my brother, my brother raised sheep for 4-H. He loved to do that. He, he just loved having sheep to do that with. I don't know why. But I don't know what you know about sheep. Sheep are not exactly God's smartest creation. 
In fact, sheep are dumb. There's literally one instance where my brother was out of town for either camp or uh, maybe he was at a friend's house, I don't remember which, but he asked me to kind of watch his sheep for him. And I went to go feed his sheep, and there was one sheep in particular that I watched run as fast as he could straight into the side of a metal barn, head first. He got up, did kind of what we all do whenever we hit our head on something, shook it off a little bit, backed up, and did it again. Sheep are dumb. So the idea that one out of 100 sheep gets lost, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. In fact, it makes more sense if, say, 90 of them got lost and only 10 of them were where they're supposed to be because sheep are left to their own devices. A sheep will end up getting itself killed. But this guy, he, he sees that one of his sheep, one of his hundred has, has left the flock, and, and he's upset by this. Sheep are not exactly cheap animals by any stretch of the imagination, really in any era, but particularly in this time period, in this culture, because sheep and lamb are kind of like the, the cornerstones of most meats. We would probably say chicken, maybe beef is our favorite thing to have, but in this particular area, in this region, sheep are it. And so he's, he's talking about the prospect of losing money if this sheep is gone forever. So instead, he decides to leave his other 99 sheep all to their own devices, the dumbest animal of God's creation. Let's leave 99 of them alone. And he goes and chases after this one. And eventually he finds it. And that's an awesome thing, right? He's finally found the sheep that he's been looking for. He puts the thing up on his shoulders to carry it back. This is a good story, I think, at this point. But then the guy does something that I think is weird. As he's bringing back his sheep, this one sheep out of a hundred that got lost, he calls out to his friends and to his neighbors and says, Hey guys, come rejoice with me. In other words, he's inviting them to come to a party. Cool, man, what are we partying for? Hey, you know that one sheep I had that got lost? I found him. And... That's it. What, what happened here? The guy starts off with 100 sheep. He ends the story with 100 sheep. All that's happened here is the status quo has been restored. And he wants to throw a party for that. Why are we celebrating that? The second story also that Jesus tells here, it, it falls a line along the same paths. It happens in verses 8 and 9 of this particular text. It says, Or what woman has ten silver coins? If she loses one, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found the silver coin I lost. It's a fairly similar story, isn't it? This woman has 10 silver coins. And now these silver coins, likely their value at that particular time period would have been about the same as a denarius. And we've talked about denarius as a, as a unit of money for several different times here. A denarius was something that if you worked as a day laborer, that was what you were expected to get paid at the end of the day. One denarius would be an entire day's wage. And so this woman having 10 is a fairly significant amount of money. It's not, you're not getting rich on it, but you're at least, you know, taken care of for the week or so. But she loses one. You ever lost a coin before? If you lose it in your whole house, you got to try to find it. But this particular coin, that's a whole day's worth of wages. It is not an insignificant amount of money by any stretch of the imagination. And so she does kind of the same thing that you and I would do in that scenario. She's turning over couch cushions. She's digging underneath furniture. She's pulling up the rug, trying to find this one coin. And then she finds it. You ever have that little moment of like, yay, whenever you've been looking for something for a while and you finally find it? And we have that expression, it's in the last place that you looked. Yeah, why would you look further? You found it. So it's the weirdest expression I think we have. The last place I thought to look for it. Yeah, you wouldn't have to think anymore. Nobody? Cool. Anyway, 
So she finds this lost coin, this one denarius, but at, again, it's, it's simply a restoration of the status quo. She started off with 10 coins, now she has 10 coins. But she again, like the shepherd, invites her friends and neighbors over to come and rejoice with her to have a party, a party for a coin. Why are we celebrating this? Again, all that's happened is the status quo has been returned. She started off with 10. She's got 10. The shepherd started off with 100. He ended up with 100. And yet both of them were so overwhelmed with their joy in that moment to throw a party at the restoration of what was already theirs. Why are we celebrating that? Then Jesus tells his third and final parable. It has similar beats. A person has something. They lose it. They eventually get it back. And in their joy, invite others to celebrate the restoration of the status quo. But of the stories that Jesus has told so far, this is really the first one of the three where that celebration feels warranted. In fact, you probably know this parable, maybe by heart even. You can tell all the story beats of this particular parable without anybody having to tell it for you. Because it starts off in verse 11, he also said, a man had two sons. Without even going further in the Bible verses, you probably know how the rest of this one goes. Because the parable that Jesus tells here, I would say is probably the most famous of all of Jesus' parable. At the very least, it's in the top two. It's one that people who've never set foot inside of a church before still know at least some semblance of this particular narrative. But just in case you happen to not be aware of what it's about, let me tell you the story. A guy has two sons. His youngest son comes to him one day and says, Father, give me my inheritance. I want to go do my own thing. And so his father gets together all the money that's supposed to go to him after his father's death He hands it to his son, and his son goes away. He leaves his father behind and goes off into a city and does all the things that we know we're not supposed to do. He squanders his money in things like drinking and partying and women and all the stuff that his father had warned him not to do. One day, eventually, the money runs out, right? Because when you're having fun, eventually that's going to happen. The money's going to run out. And in order for him to kind of make ends meet, the son has to go and, and... feed pigs, but he's so destitute and and things have been so rough for him that he actually longs to eat what he's feeding pigs. And I don't know if you know this about pigs, but they don't exactly eat the most enticing of meals. He finally gets it in his head like, you know what, maybe I need to go back to my dad's house and I don't want to go back as his son though because I've shamed him so much. Instead, maybe I can go back and plead with him to bring me on as a hired hand. But as he's getting close to his house, in fact, as the first part of verse, uh, uh, excuse me, as verse 20 says, but while the son was still a long way off, his dad instead runs right towards him. He throws his arms around him. He welcomes him back in as a son. And in fact, he he tells his people, let's go ahead and get this done. Let's have a party. Let's go and and slaughter, slaughter the fattened calf. Let's celebrate. As verse 24 puts it, because this son of mine was dead and is alive again, he's lost and he is found. So they began to celebrate. And while absolutely this is a beautiful story, while absolutely this is an amazing story of a son who wanders away, does stupid things, and still finds out that his father loves him and cares for him and welcomes him back as a son. What's really happening here? A man starts off with two sons. One does dumb things, goes away, but then comes back, leaving the man with two sons. So what are we celebrating here? We're celebrating the reestablishment of the status quo Something that was already his left, but now it's come back. Yay. Why are we celebrating? It sounds a little cynical when I say it that way, doesn't it? Because I think every one of us in here 
we understand the significance of what this is. I'll go ahead and say, especially us parents, we, we know what this would feel like to, to not know where our kid is and to not know what they're doing or who they're with or, or what kind of stuff they're into. I'm frankly getting a little nervous about the day the girls turn 16 and get their driver's license and the first time they drive away from the house. When they're with me, I know they're safe. When they're not, I don't know what's going on. And so we, we understand the, the joy that this father must have felt having been separated for his, from his son. We understand the joy of this celebration. It makes a lot of sense to us. And even with the other two narratives, the, the, the shepherd losing this one sheep and finally finding it and, and being able to reestablish it among the rest of the flock, he's so excited about this. There's a part of us that, even though we don't know sheep, we can still understand how excited he is in this. Because any shepherd that's worth its, its, his salt is going to be excited about the restoration of his whole flock. He cares about his sheep. For the woman with the ten coins, while we may not understand the need for having a party for a lost coin, we can still understand the joy that she's experiencing. She lost a significant amount of money, and now it's restored to her. There's a part of us that understands that celebration, even though, culturally speaking, it may not make a lot of sense to us. There's still the most natural thing in the world to do in this, in this moment is to celebrate. What I want to point out to you is why Jesus is telling these stories in the first place. See, I think in order for us to fully understand the parables of Jesus, we need to look at a couple of things. We need, first, the biggest thing we need to look at is the audience. Why is Jesus telling this story and to who is he telling it? And Luke did a great job of letting us know exactly who this story was for. Look again at verses 1 and 2 of this particular text. It says, all the tax collectors and the sinners were approaching to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were complaining, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. The Pharisees have been raising a stink over the idea that Jesus, this, this rabbi, this suspected prophet, would spend his time eating with sinners. The people that the Pharisees themselves would have nothing to do with. And so the Pharisees see Jesus spending an inordinate amount of time with these people and they're asking the question, why is he celebrating with them? Why is he allowing them to be a part of his life? Why is he allowing these people to be a part of his circle? So Jesus tells these narratives as a way to showing why these people matter why they're important to the heart of God and why the Pharisees themselves should be celebrating the fact that these sinners are coming to him in the first place. And each story not only ends with a celebration, but it also ends with a picture of what is happening in the realms that we cannot see. Verse 7, it says this, after the shepherd invites his friends to join in the celebration over the return of his lost sheep, it says, I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. In verse 10, when Jesus finishes talking about the woman finding her coin and celebrating it with her friends, he says, I tell you in the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. And after Jesus tells the story of the son returning to his father and and crucially, after he tells about the other brother's stubbornness in refusal to celebrate, he says in verse 32, we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost. Now he is found. Far too often in the church, We run the risk of becoming cynical. We run the risk of becoming jaded in what is taking place around us. We reach the point where our worship becomes routine. We do it because we always do it. We come here because it's just what you do on Sundays at 1030. We kind of get to this point where it becomes 
we become kind of numb to it all. And so when we see people come and make their way amongst us, when we see people who were far from God coming within our ranks, there is a part of us that begins to wonder, why are they here? We may never vocalize it, we may never say it out loud, but there is a part of us that because we have been so repetitive in our attendance at coming to church, and because we've been here for as long as we can possibly remember, there is a part of us that believes ourselves to be superior. And so we look down on these people, especially if we know what they're struggling with, if we know where their lives have taken them, and we find ourselves asking, why are they here? And when we see others around us celebrating the fact that this person is here, welcoming them in with open arms and loving them simply because they're here, we find ourselves asking the question, why are we celebrating them? We become so entrenched in our routine that we ask that question, why are we celebrating? The reality is we've forgotten. We've forgotten what it's like to be lost. We've forgotten what it's like to, to come and find the feet of Jesus and come and worship for that first time. We've forgotten what it's like when the word of God begins to penetrate our hearts and bring us a new faith and a new relationship and a new sense of love and awe and worship and wonder. We've forgotten the joy of finding the place that we were always meant to be. Folks, the church needs to be the place of celebration. We need to be the people who can't wait to celebrate when we see lives changed and altered by the word of God. We should be the people who are the ones who are, let's throw the party. When someone comes forward, when they give their life to Christ, when they go through that baptism. Because at one point in time, we were that lost sheep. At one point in time, you were that lost coin. At some point in your life, you were that prodigal. And when you came back, when you were, when you were lost but found, when you came and made your way amongst the people of God, when you suddenly found yourself at the feet of Jesus, all of heaven erupted in celebration. As the followers of Jesus Christ, we are invited to join in that celebration. When we see transformation in the lives around us, our, res our response should not be, yay. Our response should be loud, should be boisterous, it should be exciting. Because what was lost is now found. Because a father has found his beloved child again. So the question is not, why are we celebrating? The question that we should be asking ourselves, the question that hopefully should, should be bugging you right now is, why aren't you celebrating? The Spirit of God is at work in the world around us. We just need to open our eyes and see it. And when we see lives transformed, our reaction should be the same every single time. And it should be celebration. Psalm 95 verses 1 and 2 says this, and we'll close with it. It says, Come, let us shout joyfully to the Lord. Shout triumphantly to the rock of our salvation. Let's enter his presence with thanksgiving. Let's shout triumphantly to him in song.